Hi, welcome to Revved Up Recruiting for Building a Best Class Best-in-Class Workforce presented by Agilon. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to attend today. Uh, we think you're going to really get a lot of helpful insights that you can use in your roles as hiring managers and HR professionals. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping before uh, we begin. A follow-up email will be sent to you all within 48 hours. And this email will include instructions for retrieving your SHRM PDCs and HRCI recertification credit for those who are uh, looking for that. Uh, we'll be sending along a link to the video of this presentation, a copy of the presentation deck, and these, these are just things you can refer back to. And then we'll also be sending a, a, a link to take a brief under a minute survey, which will help us with the direction for future events. And uh, for those who do participate in that survey, we'll be giving away a $25 Amazon gift card to one lucky uh, participant. So keep an eye out uh, for that email with all the, uh, the, the, that information. Uh, throughout the presentation, you can use the chat function to ask our panelists questions about their presentation. You can do this throughout the whole presentation. We'll be devoting the last seven to 10 minutes of our uh, presentation to your questions. We'll have a representative here keeping an eye on, in the chat room for those questions that you have, and we'll be flagging them for that Q&A portion at the end. Uh, there is a chance we might not get to your question in today's presentation due to time constraints. That being said, we are planning uh, for a follow-up Q&A blog article that we'll post on our Agilon site. Once that article is live, we'll email that link to you so you can see your questions answered. You can also use the chat to let us know if you're experiencing any technical problems. Uh, a support representative will respond to you right away. We are so pleased to have two excellent panelists to present this webinar. I'm sure you're going to love what they have in store for you today. Our first panelist is Tisha Donnell, who has 20 years of experience in the staffing and recruiting industry. Hi, Tish. Why don't you tell our attendees a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hi everyone, and thank you Jason. I'm Tisha Donnell, and happy to be with you today. Just a little bit about myself. I actually grew up in New Jersey where I received uh, my accounting degree from Kane University. After graduation, I, I moved to Los Angeles and ended up starting as a staffing manager for accounting principals when I registered for them to look for work. And after seven years uh, with the company and a few promotions, I moved to Chicago, which is where I live now. In my 20 years with Agilon, I was lucky enough to hold seven roles, and in my current role, I support the Agilon brand by working with our leadership and teams in training and execution of our revenue goals. During the weekends, I am either at a soccer field or a basketball court watching either one of my two boys. Also, I am a Gen Xer and proud of it. Great. Thanks, Tish. Thanks for being here today. Uh, our second panelist is Linnell Flint, who has been with Agilon uh, since 1999. Hi, Linnell. Hey, Jason. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for uh, attending today. It's an honor to speak for you. As stated, I'm Linnell Flint, the Regional Vice President for Agilon, and um, my responsibility is to drive revenue and business operations for our organization across uh, Oregon, Washington, New Mexico, and Northern California. As Jason stated, I started with our organization in 99, and that was in Arizona. I was born and raised in Arizona, was able to obtain my accounting degree from the University of Arizona, go Wildcats. And um, then at a, about seven years into the organization, 10 years ago, the company promoted me and moved my family over to the Pacific Northwest. So I now live uh, just outside of Seattle, beautiful Pacific Northwest. Um, my daughter, our daughter, my husband and I have a daughter who just graduated from University of Washington 2015, and our son is about to be a freshman in high school next year. Um, we are sometimes house divided in that we love both the Cardinals and the Seattle Seahawks, um, but love this city and very, very proud to be here today. Thanks, Jason. Thanks. Thanks, Linnell. Tish, why don't you uh, give a quick introduction about Agilon? Sure. 
So Agilon is one of the professional staffing brands of the ADECO group of companies. You'll see here in the middle of, a sl of the slide our symbol, the A symbol for the ADECO group, and they own various specialty companies really around the world. Um, you'll also see they own the general staffing company ADECO, which is on the bottom of the slide. Now Agilon um, is housed in the same offices as accounting principals Parker and Lynch and Paladin. Now in terms of the specialties that we focus on, we do have three areas. One is human resources, the second one is non-clinical healthcare, and then our third is supply chain and logistics. We are in 64 locations nationwide, uh, also in the Netherlands and Australia. So our uh, discussion for today, Linnell and I are going to start off with the current state of the job market and really sharing with you guys the challenges we're facing as employers. Then we're going to get into achieving best in class and how smart sourcing, increasing your speed to hire uh, can really help. And then once you hire and attract those candidates, how do you retain them, um, especially with the low unemployment? Then um, the last slide I'll touch upon the C-suite buy-in, and as Jason said, we'll open up to Q&A. With that, I'll turn it over to Linnell to kick us off. Thank you. And I'm just going to have um, go over a brief, very high-level view of the current state of the job market just because there's so many layers to it. But we need to talk about the current state of the market in addition to what's coming over the next 5 to 10 years to really understand what those challenges Tish mentioned are going to be and, and why they're there. Uh, this is the most updated data, March 2017. that just came out a few days ago. And it states that nationally unemployment is down to 4.5% which is excellent. It's great news. Uh, down 0.2% from last month. Um, it's a zero change in the previous month for professional and business services unemployment rate, but the good news is with that 0.2% change, um, decrease in unemployment, 98,000 jobs were created. So we're talking about jobs that did not exist before. And out of that, 56,000 of those jobs were professional and business services. The market continues to get tight in that business and professional services or skilled market sector. Um, and why is that important to know? Obviously it's because the, the, the talent market is tight and you're going to have to be more competitive than ever. Now the challenges that Tish talked about are representative of the next slide and the data that we show for what the workforce will look like in the year 2025. That's only 8 years away. I know that sounds kind of crazy, 2025 is 8 years away. But you'll see this graph notes by color which generation um, is noted and which number of employees will be represented in 2025. And then um, the lower graph shows the age range. So over 75% of the workforce will be millennials and a little bit of Gen X employees by the year 2025. So a short 8 years from now, over 75% of the workforce will be it's 72% it's will be um, millennials, and 75 to 85% will be millennials plus Gen X. Baby boomers are definitely t retiring and starting to move out of the workforce. Um, right now in 2015, that mix was evenly split that Gen Xers and millennials were 50-50, and so millennials will overtake uh, Gen X by 25% in the next 8 years. That brings a host of challenges to entice recruit, and as Tish uh, mentioned, retain uh, employees that we've not really had in our forces, in our workforce over the last 10 to 15 years, and they bring with them unique desires and, and wants um, as an employee. So Tish, why don't you talk about those challenges and what we're going to be up against? Sure. All right, so just to build upon um, you know, that the stat where you see where the workforce is projected in 2025, really right now um, the, the workforce is generational diverse. And first, um, you know, we're, we're seeing that the multi-generational workforce have very, a lot of different generations working, not just the millennials, but we also have Gen Y that's coming up, or the recent grads, as well as Generation Z, which I think are still um, you know, just starting to get into the workforce. So not only do the, all the different generations have to get along, but they also have to be productive. 
And I think, you know, the first thing if, if you, uh, employers will have to do is to accept um, that that is going to happen and to adjust uh, to the new landscape of the workforce. You know, keeping in mind that the majority of the um, um, uh, millennials and the uh, Gen Zs coming in, they've been raised on the Internet and social media. Also, to uh, give a quick update on the baby boomers, we really started to see a drop uh, in the workforce back in 26, uh, I remember 2006 or 7 when I, we first started hearing about the baby boomers retiring um, uh, by 2013, it actually really didn't happen. When the recession hit years ago, many boomers did not retire, but now with the returning economy and the improving economy, we are definitely seeing the change. And you could see here in the last four years, 8 million baby boomers have dropped, to the labor, um, have dropped from the labor workforce. So really the point here is, um, you know, millennials will be the ones that we will be hiring. And um, I want to ask you, how have you adjusted, your company adjusted, your hiring and recruiting strategies? Another phenomenon that I wanted to uh, talk about is the emergence of the gig or sharing economy. Now, there's no official definition, but really a gig is described as a single project or task which a worker is hired for. You know, obviously similar to the consulting or temporary work, but what we are seeing is an increase where people want to work um, where they want and when they want. So similar to a gig like a musician, people are just wanting to work for, let's say, six months and then take a three-month um, tour to backpack through Europe or road trip across America. We really are seeing that work-life balance has been recalibrated. Now take a deep breath, Gen Xers, because for me, when I was look, reading about this, I, I just can't wrap my head around this either, but we are definitely starting to see it in our interviews. But really, if you take a look at some of the companies that have started to emerge, like Airbnb, Uber, Rent the Runway, where really they're sharing their products. So sharing is more normalized, um, and um, we're seeing it more and more within this economy. So I guess why not job share? With the increase of the contingent, contingent workforce to 18.5%, really the best-in-class companies and recruiters should embrace these cultural trends in order to attract and retain top talent. Now, I don't think that you have to offer a sabbatical, um, but think about what your company is doing to offer some form of flexibility. Another way I think you can look at this sharing economy is how many people now share their experience with a restaurant or a specific business, not in just uh, social media, but also with a lot of their friends. So we are seeing a similar uh, case in job hunting. So now we're, and we're calling it the Yelpification of the job market where Rotten Tomatoes were used to grade movies and Yelp is how to grade restaurants. Now we have Glassdoor um, reigning jobs and employers. And as an update of July 2016, Glassdoor can boast approximately 30 million users who have contributed nearly 10 million unique reviews and of over 540,000 companies. It's really a lot and a lot of growth. How is your company rated in Yelp or Glassdoor? Have you checked lately? You can really easily find information and ratings about best-in-class companies. So one of the companies that started seeing the change in the workforce, KPMG, recently conducted a survey of 400 new graduates, mostly millennials. The survey revealed that more than one-third were annoyed on how long they had to wait or had to wait to hear about an outcome of an interview as well as how long the recru recruitment process took. The top complaints of millennial job seekers were, you'll see here on the slide, lack of feedback, poor communication, length of wait, of to hear how the interview went, length of recruitment, and overall the amount of different stages within an interview. So really not surprising as impatience is a millennial trait, but good or bad, that is the reality that us recruiters and HR professionals face. Millennials want effective interview processes. They want feedback, whether they're right for the job or not. And they prefer this all occurs within a few days. 
So think about your hiring process. Expediting hiring can really save your business time and money since you'll reduce the number of jobs and unproductive hours. So I'll move it over to Linnell now to talk about best in class and what it means. Hi, Linnell. I think you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> so we all want to be best in class um, employers, don't we? We all want to vie for that top 100 best places to work every year. And it's a key metric in knowing and uh, retain, recruiting and retaining the best talent out there. But what is best in class and how is that defined? I think everybody has a different definition. If you ask your employees and your staff, they're probably going to say things like best benefits or great comp plans, perhaps Perhaps it's the culture and a high level of job satisfaction or personal satisfaction. But there's actually um, a specific metric out there, key performance indicators that are used by the industry and uh, workforce e experts out there. And those three things that are used as KPIs in determining best in class or top 100 workforce places is length of time to hire, so how long it takes you to uh, identify a need is coming up, whether it be a succession planning or a refill position, um, to the time that you have a, someone in the seat and actually producing. Then revenue per full-time employee, so your total sales revenue as an organization divided by your full-time employees and whether or not that's healthy for your kind of industry and your market. And then the rate of unwanted turnover, which of course HR professionals professionals and hiring managers are always thinking about and worried about. So those three areas um, are the, the major key indicators. They're not the only ones, but they're the major key indicators. And if you are a best-in-class workforce, you are in the top 20% of organizations for those key areas. So best-in-class top 20% means you've shown a 26.2% decrease in time to hire year over year over the last couple of years. You have shown and you understand that the workforce is changing, technology is changing, and people want access to you and your organization quickly. They want response time quickly, and you've decreased your time to hire. Your revenue increase has happened at 11.5% increase year over year per employee that you hire. So you should be showing an increase in annual revenue every time you get an FTE on board. And then your um, unwanted turnover for the first 12 months of an employee's life with you is 9.4%. That is what is indicated as a best-in-class workplace. You can see the mid-industry average as well as the lagging or, or bottom 30% of performers. Um, and what would be key for me is to see that the unwanted turnover numbers are pretty significant in that laggard bottom 30% at 19.1%. So again, re uh, recruiting and enticing candidates is important, but so is retention, correct? All right. So, as we all know, um, our people is what can make or break an organization. And so in order to build a really strong foundation, we have to attract the best qualified candidates. So our first tactic or best practice to achieving best in class status is to make sure you recruit and source smart. Um, are you posting and sourcing for those candidates in the right place and with the right tools? So earlier in the digital age, um, you know, 15, 20 years ago when I started in this business, Monster came on board. Monster.com came on board and we thought, gosh, that is just going to take over the world and there's not going to be any recruiting agencies or recruiters in the world. Um, so Monster.com came out, CareerBuilder.com came out and kind of revolutionized the way that classified ads and job posting was done. Um, they They've lost a lot of ground in the last year, those two websites, Monster and CareerBuilder, but the Internet in general and posting and, and seek job seekers going to the Internet uh, to find their next home has not decreased. 83% of people who responded to a survey that Agilon ran in 2016 said the first place they go is still the Internet. Now that's a broad answer the Internet because it means all sorts of, of different places. It could be company websites or it could be job boards. But it does show that you still need a heavy presence as an employer out on the web to make sure that you are getting the best candidate possible. Staffing firms only were 10%, 17% um, of it, so 83% were Internet and the 17% rounded out with more personal sources like uh, personal friends, schools, professional networking, and then 10% staffing. So we asked a follow-up question in that because we, we liked the answer of Internet, but it was too broad. We asked a follow-up question to our survey, and it was, you know, in this World Wide Web, what is the primary source 
for your job search specifically. And Indeed, um, the website Indeed came up number one very strongly as 22% of, um, of job seekers were going to that ind individual website first. The other 22% where it says job boards, those were boards that um, really they weren't even boards necessarily. They were just places on the Internet that somehow had posted positions like Facebook, uh, YouTube was even in there, random locations that the, the number of responses were not strong enough to, to validate having its own category. But it was still important to show that 22% of respondents did still look at some sort of online job board. Um, LinkedIn had a 15% showing, making it the online equivalent of a professional net networking group like JCs and Rotary for many job seekers um, and professional folks. And it's still a strong, strong area in, uh, excuse me, um, LinkedIn is still a strong area of recruitment for passive candidates that are skilled employees like the ones we hire every day. So, if we move on to ideas and the best practices of sourcing for candidates, um, let's round up the top three that we believe and we have seen from our clients and organizations uh, do the best or have the most success. Um, Bureau of Labor Statistics, so BLS, projects employment for all business and financial op um, operations occupations will grow 8%. So no matter what it is, no matter what the business industry is, it's gonna, your organization's employment need is going to grow 8% through the year 2024, so over the next 7 years. Finding candidates with that right combination of soft and hard skills is going to be essential and it's going to be increasingly challenging due to the labor skills gap we just discussed a minute ago. So 31% of companies that were considered best in class are more likely to increase their hiring over the next year to, to proactively help uh, combat that skills gap. How do we do that? 40% of those that are considered best in class and have the best recruiting practices out there showed that they did social sourcing and pipelining, so proactive pipelining and, and social sourcing. Um, for instance, for candidates who were applying for a position at 45000 to 50000 and above, so candidates 45K and above, the majority of candidates were coming from LinkedIn, specifically LinkedIn Mobile. Are you using social sourcing like LinkedIn and other social sources that have a mobile app um, application and, and uh, option as a source for your recruiting. Then they are moved on to um, referral bonus programs. Um, they are another method increasing, increasing used by companies. Some programs offer between $2,000 and $5,000 per employee referral. Um, don't neglect on your internal recruiting. Recruiting from within is a great strategy in having a succession plan for internal promotions, but that still usually ends up uh, creating an opening somewhere internally that you are going to have to fill, and thus you need a strong pipeline and referrals program is, is a good way to do it. And then digital advertising will never go, I shouldn't say never, but will likely not go anywhere anytime soon. If you do not know what SEO is, search engine optimization, and using that practice in posting your jobs digitally, you need to do so right away to ensure that you are ranked up in Google and Indeed searches and your organization comes up quickly first. Um, they look refreshed and new, and um, you just have a strong presence compared to other employers. And so um, why? Why is it important? We've talked about the importance of having a strong foundational team. But what, what else? The cost of having a bad hire is extremely high. Uh, a bad hire costs money, but it also costs time. And there are specific statistics out there and numbers as you can see on the screen that show if you have an employee who's around that normal mid, or excuse me, normal entry level range salary of forty thousand dollars, it will cost six thousand dollars, forty percent of their salary, to replace that um, individual. If you have an employee at eighty thousand dollars, it will cost you hundred and twenty thousand dollars to replace them because their number, their their aggregate, their um, their percentage number is 150% of their base salary. And if you are replacing an executive of any um, sort, 100K and above, it's 400% over their base that it costs you to replace them, and that is the cost of a bad hire. So make sure that when you are sourcing, you are doing it smart and you are using the right process to find the best candidate, not just the best candidate who happened to fall on your desk or happened to re respond to your job posting.
Um, an effective applicant sourcing and communication strategy is needed for that. And there's multiple steps in going through that. Um, I'm just going to move on to the very first step of telling you guys interviews are not enough. And I know that kind of flies in the face of what everyone has held dear and known for so long. But according to the most recent University of Washington study, or excuse me, University of Michigan study, a typical interview increases your chances of choosing the best candidate by only 2%. Let me just repeat that. Your interview process inter increases your chances of choosing the best candidate by only 2%. There are too many other factors that play in, and there are too many people who can act well enough to get through an interview um, not being themselves and not telling the truth. Makes other options for that, and other options outside of interviewing are multi-team or multi-department conversations, uh, little coffee breaks and or 10 or 15 minute chats with other departments and other um, team members who may not have any skin in the game. Um, personality assessments, they used to be really cost prohibitive and difficult to administer, but with the digital age and everything um, so technically savvy nowadays, it's very easy to administer a personality assessment and it's become very cost effective. Skills Assessments are always a huge player. You can um, reach out to a staffing agency like ours and they will administer skills assessments like Excel or uh, math tests or just general um, language arts tests for free most of the time. I know our organization does. Um, and then like homework assignments, perhaps after the interview making sure that you ask them for some sort of writing sample or maybe if the position really um, if it applies to this position, some sort of work sample. You can test their, their response time, their desire for how interested they are, and their motivation on how interested they are in your position by giving them a, a homework assignment after the interview. And that's going to improve your chances of making a better hire. So to get the candidate source going properly, to get the quantity of candidates you need, you're going to have to craft a really good job description. Make sure that your job descriptions don't have short shelf lives where you don't refresh them or they show that they're, um, you know, after two weeks they're going to show up on the 10th page or 11th page of Indeed and Google. Um, express the expectations that you're going to have in this position very accurately. Don't shy away from being honest about the challenges. Communicate the job responsibilities honestly. Again, don't shy away from trying to sugarcoat it to, to um, not scare people off. And then avoid the common pitfalls of over -constraining, uh, overly constraining types of, of words and stifling or really overly technical job postings and making it boring. Um, make sure you use innovative thinking and kind of a talk to text mentality seems to be working nowadays in job postings. Then make sure you publicize those positions as we discussed on job boards first and foremost. I know it is a cost to do so, but it's so um, important. If you remember the, the graph, we just saw that 83% of job seekers are going to the Internet first. Um, but also free way of, the free way of posting it out there is social media. If you have a Facebook page that your company um, runs on its own, you can post it on your Facebook page, and then your employees can share that link on all social media sites um, like Facebook, like uh, Snapchat, like even LinkedIn. And then again, just like we mentioned a second ago, don't forget about promoting from within, looking within your ranks first to see if there's someone who can stretch, and a referral program. Make the job postings anti-boilerplate. Make sure they're super interesting. So the other thing you can use Glassdoor for besides uh, looking at your, your reputation on Glassdoor and seeing how you're ranking on reviews is search other jobs that are like yours. Search other companies that are like yours and see how you are stacking up to their job postings. See how you're stacking up to how they're explaining themselves. Put, make sure you would tout your competitive advantage, your, um, what, what makes it so enticing to work for your organization. Don't be afraid to brag on yourself. And then make sure, I know it's, it's um, again a cost. People think of it as a cost, but the mobile um, application process is sweeping across the recruiting and employment world. Work with your digital production team. Make sure all job postings are mobile friendly and that there is a responsive design. It absolutely will, will be a game changer if you make your application process and, um, and recruiting process mobile friendly. Don't forget, we just talked about it a second ago, leverage that social media. 61% um, of applicants named culture um, – oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. 
I meant to go on forward about the employee, re uh, employee referral program. Cultivate your culture. Consider the strategy that you have for an internal program. Is it monetary? Is it uh, you, know, you, you get the Employee of the Month award? If you get uh, the most amount of referrals, make it a competitive situation. Make sure it's brought to light in many situations that internal referrals are highly desired and that um, you will be considered a successful team, teammate and a good you know, citizen, corporate citizen, if you recruit and refer internal refer referrals. It is shown that the data shows that internal referrals stay and ret are retained much longer than those who come off the street. Um, okay, and then um, make sure you manage your reputation. We talked about Glassdoor. We talked about Yelpification of the job market. Do as Tish said. Go and check and make sure how you, what, is, what are you being seen as out on the, the general market? What is it that your name um, says when people go look for uh, your company and employment opportunities with you? Monitor the prominent sites that everyone is speaking about and everyone goes to. And then loop in marketing and communications, your public relations team. In, if in fact you need to um, make your presence more robust, if you need to up your game and make your name look a little, your company look a little better, or maybe you need to mitigate some risk because someone did write a negative review. But you don't know and you can't manage that reputation unless you go look and you look often. Don't just look one time. Okay? And then eliminate, I know this is something that people don't think about. It's something out of the left field. Eliminate the link, weak LinkedIn profiles that your leadership team may have posted out on the, the Internet. Um, one of the first things that employees nowadays or, or prospective employees do is go look for information on that leadership team to see if they have some sort of connection or something that they can connect to this person about. And or they look to see if this is someone they can learn from. What is it going to um, get from this organization or from this relationship? If you have weak profiles of your leadership team out there, fix them. Um, take them down or fix them because they are being looked at quite a bit right now. And then um, as Tish mentioned earlier, one of the biggest or the biggest complaint of millennials that are looking for jobs right now was the follow-up was lacking, specifically um, follow-up when someone didn't get a job. But follow-up promptly. Send an app, all applicants an automatic e email reply if you have the ability to do so, just saying that you received the resume and it's in review. But also send a personalized email when possible if they have not been chosen, if they're not going to be moving forward in the process. Again, timing is important. It can't be two weeks after the candidate has, um, has applied. It needs to be pretty quick, like within 48 hours. And then don't forget about phone, Skype, FaceTime, um, all those web-based interview processes or options. Those are important when you're talking about millennials who want immediate gratification and immediate response time. Lastly, I would just challenge you not to forget about those folks who you don't hire. There are a lot of candidates who I think you probably see or hear from that you would like to have on your team but perhaps need a little more education, a little more information, or excuse me, um, uh, just some, some more uh, experience to their profile and their background before you can hire them. D there is a lot to be said about taking care and keeping care of people once they're saying goodbye. My daughter recently has been looking for a job and received the nicest rejection letter um, from an organization she was super interested in telling her she was the type of candidate and character they would love to have in their organization and that they would really like for her to apply again until she was able to get into the organization. And now she has them on um, auto alert. So anytime they post a job or there's something in the, um, on the Internet or in the news about them, it comes up on her news feed on her phone and she immediately goes to see if she can post um, a position um, or excuse me, post her resume to that position. She wants to work for that organization because they care and they treated her with respect. So don't ignore that when you, for, when you do have to say goodbye to people. Um, I'm going to turn this back to Tish for a second so that she can talk about our, uh, our next tactic, Tactic 2, and how to become a best-in-class workforce. All right. Well, thank you, Ms. Linnell. So now that um, we've gone over how to recruit and source qualified candidates, uh, and we also talked about how to move them through um, the process, now it's really taking a look at um, how you're going to uh, make sure that you, get, you hire them. Because what we're seeing now in some of the companies that I've talked to say, Tisha, we're, we are interviewing good candidates, but we can't hire them because they're taking other offers. So first, take a look at uh, your process. And why should you speed up your hiring process? 
well, we touched upon the challenges facing employers and have established that changing your hiring process will make you more attractive to candidates. Um, they will share their experience with their friends and therefore net you more referrals. It also is more efficient and gives you the competitive advantage. So remember the um, case with KPMG where they surveyed um, a group of millennials and they received feedback that their specific hiring process was too long? Well, as a result, they recognized that a large group of their applicants were millennials and were being frustrated and dissatisfied with the process. So they made big changes to attract the top talent and therefore minimizing losing their hires to their own competition, maybe those quick moving startups and tech companies. And KPMG really made a change where their goal is to focus on an improved hiring process in order to get the best talent. Another company which is a good example is Unilever. Um, they made big change, changes in their hiring process to attract more talent and specifically millennials. So they took a process that used to take four months and shortened it to two weeks. That really is a huge change. So let's take a look at their four-step interview process. First, the candidate completes an online application that syncs with their LinkedIn pro profile. This is a nice win because it's a social media tie-in. Then they will receive a text and email confirmation of the application. Second, the candidate completes 12 online games that are mobile friendly and takes about 20 minutes to complete. Guys, these, this is really cutting edge technology because this is in place of those traditional personality assessments that can feel very old school or dull. Third, they participate in a video interview process, and then if they're moved to the final round, they're invited to a full day event where they uh, live a day in the life at Unilever and then be immersed in the company culture. You know, really their goal is at the end of the day, you want to be, make sure that your offer is accepted. Also love the way they use the games. Um, so great example of, of two companies that have changed. So really quickly, what can you do right away uh, maybe to shorten your interview process? First, take advantage of technology. Uh, Linnell touched upon it earlier for quicker, more efficient interview process. Also, this opens up your candidate pool um, to uh, – it doesn't limit your geography, so you can interview more candidates. Also, instead of conducting a series of interviews over several weeks, have your interviewers sit in either one session or one location. This really saves time for all parties. Lastly, um, obviously working with staffing companies like Agilon, we can handle the pre-interview due diligence. Um, our highest level of service that I want to share with you guys, our clients really like, is what we call the priority hire. When our client has an opening, we block off um, anywhere from maybe three to four hours of time. We hold the interviews either in our office or at their location, and a recruiter brings in the top three or four candidates. The hiring manager interviews them. We debrief the candidates right after the interview, and after the block of interviews, we get feedback from the candidate. We give it to the client. The hiring manager gives us feedback, and then their final interview is at the client site. So this is just an example of how you can speed up that interview process and you know, make sure that you're not losing your offer. By the time you put together an offer, your candidate already took a job. Lastly, I definitely want to point out that it's really not just the millennials. We conducted a survey of 1,500 professionals on seeking employment, and 90% believe that the entire hiring process right now um, is too long, and it should take less than four weeks. And even 54% of them said it should be less than two weeks. So right now, the average interview takes about 23 days, and the time to close is up to 43 days. So speaking, I think generally speaking, um, as a market, uh, we are not meeting our candidates' expectations. So I think if your company improves on their speed to hire, you will have a leg up um, and have candidates looking at your job and your company. They're going to stand out from those uh, that are looking. All right, I'll turn it back over to Linnell to talk about retaining 
uh, our candidates. So yes, thank you, Tish. The best um, the, the, to round out our top three best practices or best tactics, we would say retention, um, holding on to that top talent is key, and it's going to be really important since everything is so competitive um, over the next five to eight years. So hone in on one thing, and that one thing right now is culture. Without a doubt, we are hearing that culture is the most important thing for um, colleagues that are in that Gen X and below um, age group. Uh, a so solid company culture will do much of the recruiting for you if you put yourself out there and you advertise yourself like we discussed. I don't know if you guys know this, but companies can lose 50 to 60% of a person's annual salary um, when they have a bad turnover and it, is, it, it, it goes along with bad press and PR. Values align your key cultural traits to make sure you have a good culture in place. Communication is key um, beyond social media. Give promising applicants access to your facility so they can get uh, a first-hand experience of the day-to-day -day operations. Here at Agilon we do a shadow, a work shadow even for our front desk receptionists so that the, we're truly transparent with our candidates to ensure they know what kind of uh, technical skills we require, what the job will require technically, but also environment. It can be loud and it can be um, really fast-paced. So we want people to see that before they take a, a leap in. Promote growth through coaching and mentoring. Make sure you select people who are, are going to be your next leaders, the, the leaders of the next millennia, and um, give them an opportunity to be leaders and managers even without the title. People want to train. They want to develop others. They want to feel like they are needed and being appreciated. And providing and creating a mentoring or coaching opportunity is a good way to do that. And gamification. Um, request and reward referrals is, is part of the, the incentivizing of, of like giving a, a reward for doing something as a corporate citizen, but there's this other gamification that Tish was talking about to just make your work environment fun. It's become a big thing. I would recommend you guys go look uh, for an app, app out on your phone called Kahoot. That's K-A-H-O-O-T. And actually there's a website too. You can use it on, online as a website and an app. It's um, an awesome quiz-based uh, game that is being used in schools and in training settings for employers across the country, and we're using it now uh, for both ourselves and for our clients. And it is the best way I've been able to personally find um, to have people retain certain content that usually they don't retain because it's boring. Um, some other ideas are there's a new corporate Minute to Win It game. I don't know if you guys remember there was a game show out there called Minute to Win It, and um, there were fun active activities that people had to do. We have organizations that are pairing division against division or department against department to do Minute to Win It games to create a five-minute fun break. I mean literally just five minutes where everybody gets up and does something crazy fun and then gets back to work. Bingo Friday is an option, doing the same thing. Maybe summer hours and compiling those two together, having a Bingo Friday at 1 p.m. and the winner of the bingo. Friday gets to leave one hour early during the summertime. Think outside the box and do things that are small. They don't have to be big things like taking an entire day off or, or gift cards. or It doesn't have to be spendy. It's small things that um, are just different and make people um, become energized during the day to create a fun culture that people want to work with, work in. And then normally what happens is your colleagues and your employees take pictures and post that on their social media platform, their own social media platform to show, look at how silly I was at work today. Look at what happened. I got, I got to leave work early today because I won bingo. And that will do the recruiting for you. So culture is key. And then to wrap this up, I'm going to pass it back to Tish. Actually, uh, hey, Linnell, before you switch over, we've had a few questions in the chat asking if you could uh, say that app again, Kahoot. Was that sure. what it was? It is Kahoot. Yep, it's K-A-H-O-O-T. And anybody, um, as you guys know, Jason said at the beginning, we'll be sending out some um, information after this webinar is con concluded with my email address in there. Anyone who wants to know how to use it or how I use it, um, please let me know. I love it, and I'm telling you right now, I train um, new employees all the time. It's the best way I've been able to, to get them to retain and have fun and enjoy training versus looking at it like school. All right, off to Tish now. Is that good? All right. Okay, so just to bring it all home, now that we've talked about all these different strategies, how can we execute? And as you guys know, um, in order to execute, we need to have uh, buy-ins from the C-suite and the executives. 
So the first, just a few, um, I think, uh, cases that um, I know and pointers that we could share. Um, first is we've got to make the business case, and you know, really the bottom line matters, especially to the, the executives. Um, know the numbers well before pitching any initiative to upper management. Um, some of the numbers that I would share is that cost of turnover that Linnell talked about. Also, um, take a look at um, you know, what the time, how long it's taking to, for a person to be productive and maybe tying some dollars and cents into that uh, as well as onboarding. I know uh, personally with our HR, we've seen some of those reports and it's really eye-opening when you see dollars and cents connected to you know, the time to get one of our new employees uh, productive. Second, uh, definitely speak their language. You know, all um, executives have different personalities, so craft your pitch accordingly. Some people like the big data, and then sometimes they just want a compelling narrative with some examples, especially if we've lost a few candidates. Also, never stop learning. Uh, I commend you all for um, attending the webinar. Um, hopefully you guys were able to find some information uh, and were certainly able to provide more to stay current on the topics and what we're seeing in the marketplace. And it never hurts to find a champion in the upper ranks, you know, maybe someone that really buys into um, you know, uh, the initiatives that you are trying to set forth. Now, I'll close with a, a quick story where I presented at a human resources networking event in January. And um, uh, we discussed a similar topic, the same topic, and a vice president of HR for a large retail chain uh, headquartered here in Chicago talked about how they have implemented some of these changes, you know, incorporated social media over the last two years. When I asked him how he did that or how they were able to uh, implement it, he mentioned that the CAO really supported and was a sponsor for this initiative and told the departments that if they do not hire faster, like changing some of their hiring process, he took away their headcount. And um, the VP of HR mentioned it really helped. They saw a, um, an increase in their hires and also their candidate flow. So thank you all today uh, for your time. I hope you enjoyed uh, our discussion, and I'll turn it back to Jason for some questions. Yeah, we received some great questions in our chat room. Uh, we're gonna, we'll take a handful right now, um, and then any that we don't answer today we'll address in a blog post. Um, so this first one um, I'll uh, give to Linnell. Uh, Linnell, can you elaborate on the details of percentage of cost to hire a position, what does cost entail? And this is from Alicia. Sure, sure, Alicia. Um, I can't give you an exact percentage number because I don't know how your organization works with regard to benefit costs and um, what you offer a new hire upon uh, employment, but I can tell you what goes into um, rehiring or, or when, when an applicant, when a position is open, we're taking into consideration or the experts take into consideration the cost of posting that job out onto um, digital platforms or in print. They ta uh, take into consideration a good chunk of it, over 50% of the cost is factored in for how much it costs your internal employees to take away from their desk and their normal job to interview and, um, and process new applicants, but also to take on the workload that is having to be done when a seat is open. And then there's a factor of how much it costs to have an internal employee, whether it be a supervisor or um, a peer, do the training of someone when they're new. And then there's a factor in there of intellectual property and intellectual knowledge that left if, if you're replacing someone versus it's a new hire or a new position. The cost it's going to take to replace the intellectual um, knowledge and property that left your organization and went to another one, the time that it takes for a new hire to ramp up to that level of intellectual knowledge and property is factored in as a cost point as well. Um, so those are the major factors. There's some other small things in there like new hire costs of um, IT processes, um, small things like you know, getting a desk set up and uh, taking them to lunch for a welcome lunch and all of that stuff. But those are very, very minor compared to the other factors I just spoke about. That's great. Thanks, Linnell. Um, yeah. So Tish, I'm going to send this one to you. We actually have 
two people who have asked about a similar thing, and, and I know you're, you're familiar with the supply chain and logistics uh, warehouse uh, atmosphere, but we had a couple questions about um, kind of tailoring a strategy for uh, the blue-collar worker or the, the less technically savvy, um, not so professional uh, environment. Okay. Well, I, I think that um, it, you know, uh, social media um, is a great way to communicate. You know, regardless of where, um, you know, uh, what you're doing for work. Um, I know Facebook, probably we're seeing now, is one of the most popular social media sites. Um, also, I would consider um, Instagram is up and coming. Um, so I would take a look at, I mean, look at your workforce, right? And, and then maybe come up with um, where is, is it a generation? You know, if it is a specific generation, where do they communicate? Where do they go to? Because that's where you want to communicate to as a company um, or, you know, reach out to them, I guess, as an employer. Um, you know, I would say, you know, we're, we're seeing, especially in supply chain logistics, you know, I think that faster, you know, um, faster and, uh, you know, com communicate faster, get the, uh, the uh, you know, the product faster. I mean, they are all very aware that, um, you know, that is up and coming. And, you know, I think that they definitely, you know, are also would respond to the same tactics that we've talked about. Just tailor it to the workforce that you are um, looking to hire for. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for referral programs as well, um, mm -hmm. and and word of mouth, uh, you know, really kind of is an important role, uh, plays an important role uh, in 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 recruiting uh, and helping to recruit. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so back to you, Linnell. What effect does a Glassdoor uh, rating have on a company's ability to recruit if their company's ratings are not tip top? And this one's from Trisha. Yep. Um, really depends on the the person you're trying to attract. The answer varies based on the age great, uh, group or um, sector of employees. So for instance, uh, millennials and, and what, what are they calling the new one? Generation Z, I think? Anybody who is yeah, under Gen 22? Z, Gen yeah. Z. So Gen Z and millennials are weighting those reviews on Glassdoor heavily. Um, it's one of the first places they go because of the Yelpification of the marketplace. Um, anytime a millennial or Gen Z um, individual is going to buy something or make a very important decision, they are going and looking for reviews first. So it's heavily weighted in those age groups. Now if you are talking about hiring folks who are Gen X and above, baby boomers, not so much. Um, I think they know because they have been out in the workforce long enough and they have been out in the world long enough to know to take those types of things with a grain of salt. They may factor into the choice, but not weigh as heavily. Um, I would tell you that I think it's going to become more prevalent. I think as technology and the um, gig economy, the sharing economy continues to grow. Um, the economy of, of information at your fingertips immediately continues to blossom. It's going to get bigger and bigger because you are going to – and the millennials are going to be 75% of our workforce shortly. Those, they are looking for reviews, and it's going to play a big factor. I also want to add to that. Um, I think that um, if you are seeing some negative reviews, I mean, really, you could balance it out also with some positive reviews. And I think yes. people, you know, you think about it when you're looking at a product. Um, usually, there's if there's more positive than negative, then I'm pretty much saying, okay, that's not that bad. So I would say balance it out, and um, you know, suggest your either your um, uh, your employees um, to also when they have a good experience, share a good review. So I don't think Glassdoor is the be all end all, but you know, I do think that they're um, in terms of the job market. They're and uh, so, Tisha, we've had some questions about a few questions about shadowing prior to an offer um, yeah. is given. Can you speak to that at all? And yeah. if that's a good so, idea? Yes, yeah, and um, I, I do think it is. I, I especially, um, you know, when we talked about uh, the cost of um, uh, turnover, and you know, when you have someone you hired, and then 90 days later they leave. Um, shadowing is you know, part of the interview process. Uh, I know that 
one of the questions I've, I've received is if um, we pay them for it, for the time um, in the office. And really, I know um, most of the companies that I've talked to, they make it part of their interview process. Um, if you have them, um, you know, with depending also the amount of time that they spend there. So I know for us, we typically do two to three hours. And, you know, a lot of the applicants like it because they're, um, you know, they're really seeing the culture, they're meeting more than just one or two people, and they can make a better decision. I know, Linnell, you guys, um, you know, I know that you do shadowing um, or what, mm -hmm. what call the, uh, the audition. Yeah. It does, it does increase, um, I think someone asked about liability, it does increase your liability if you choose not to hire that person because there are, um, the, the individual could come back and say it was a personality thing, I spent time and I said something wrong, or you guys just didn't like me. And the more you interact that potential employee with existing colleagues and they get to talk to more existing people, <coughs> excuse me, the chances of them crying foul as to why you didn't hire them does increase. So I would say we only shadow those folks that we are almost set on. We know that they are a good candidate. They have gone through a very lengthy process, and we are probably going to give them an offer. Um, they have gone through several steps first. Um, but it doesn't increase the, the liability or concerns um, enough to outweigh the benefits. And I think what we continue to hear from both clients and internally is I didn't realize what kind of job I was getting into with regard to most of the time, culture. Most of the time it's culture. It's not the job duty that they were questioning or unhappy with. It's the environment that they ended up going into that they, they didn't realize they'd be in that type of an environment. So if you can get them ingrained or engrossed into that culture right from the get-go, even if it's just for half of an hour, it helps. It helps the process. We've, we've had some questions about uh, Glassdoor. Just going back to Glassdoor uh, before we jump on to probably one more question after this one. People are wondering about uh, if reviews on Glassdoor or review sites are able to be changed. They're not able to be – I'll take that, sorry. They're not able to be changed unless you can prove that it was a false uh, or slander post. If you can prove that it was um, – someone just being mean or perhaps they are saying false things and you can prove that, it can be removed. The only way to counter or improve a Glassdoor rating is to make sure you get a number of positive, re positive reviews. It's very much like Google um, reviews and Yelp reviews in that the percentage of total reviews is what factors into your score. So if you have two poor reviews, you need five positive reviews to outweigh that and bring your score up. I will say it's legal and often you used um, or suggested by Glassdoor, the, the website themselves, to have your existing employees go on and do Glassdoor reviews on their experience um, within your organization. It's what happens is most of the time people who leave the company go do a review. And it is acceptable and suggested by Glassdoor to have people who are currently there, maybe even people who have just onboarded and are new, go on board and or go onto the site and post postings about their experience over the last few years that they've been an employee and or their experience of interviewing with you and, and onboarding. And that's really the only way to do it. I want to grab, um, Jason, I want to grab a question that I just happened to see because it, it came about from a client of ours yesterday on texting with candidates. Um, someone asked about, you know, it seems like the candidates want to text nowadays more than before. And instead of texting from our cell phone, can you text from your PC? Yes, there are quite a few ways, and I would suggest it. I would agree that uh, it's something like 85% of candidates and respondees to studies are showing that they would reply to a text way faster and uh, um, and more quickly than an email or a phone call. So I would just tell you there's a website um, and an article I, I looked up yesterday for a client of ours. Just Google five ways to text from your laptop. Five ways to text from your laptop. It's a Mashable um, posting. Mashable is a website, M-A-S-H-A-B-L-E. Mashable is the website. Five ways to text from your laptop. They had some really great ideas and suggestions on how to, um, how to text from your PC no matter what kind of PC you have. And I tried a couple of the practices and they do work. So I just wanted to answer that quickly. Well, that's great. And I think that's actually going to be all the time that we have today. Um, we, we did have a lot of questions, some about feedback. They want to hear more about Kahoot. 
uh, fit issues, um, when, when, when they're not a right fit, how do you respond to them, some social mm -hmm. sourcing um, strategies if people like more on that. So we're definitely going to follow up with a blog post or two, and uh, we will send that information out. Um, but I, first I want to thank our panelists, Tisha Donnell and Linnell Flint. Thank you both. Um, we are grateful for your insights and wonderful presentation today. And also, thank you to everyone who attended. We appreciate you ta taking the time out of your day. Don't forget to keep an eye out for that email with SHRM and HRCI credit redemption instructions, a link to the presentation and the video of the presentation, and a post-webinar survey where we'll be awarding uh, one survey participant a $25 Amazon gift card uh, for your feedback. So thank you again. Thank you, panelists, and have a great rest of your week, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you, guys.